This session kicks off with Dr. Jahu. Dr. Hu is a primary care physician, co-chair, co-founder of 19 to 0, and member of Cleveland Clinic, Canada's medical director program. He is currently a medical officer of health at Alberta Health, Ser health Services, where he's played an important role in many aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic, including scaling up of testing and contact tracing, development of the mobile tra contact tracing app, assisting organizations with COVID-19 preparedness and reopening, and engaging in risk communications. Dr. Hu, it's a pleasure to welcome you. Oh, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I'm uh, Dr. Jia Hu. I'm a medical officer of health in Alberta. Um, lead a national coalition called 19 to 0, which comprised of lots of people from, you know, public health, government, academia, but also, you know, civil society and private industry just around ending COVID as quickly as possible. And I, you know, I, I think that Throughout this pandemic, you know, uh, some people in public health have certainly been focused on <clears throat> COVID. Uh, but I think that before this, my, my day job was to try to get people vaccinated with the other stuff. And, you know, those are really, really important. So, you know, vaccinations have saved millions, maybe even tens, tens or hundreds of millions of lives, I think. Um, a lot of the diseases that we sort of just take for granted, um, well, as not existing anymore, uh, were basically dealt with by immunization. I know it's pretty hard to read the slide, but you know you have things like diphtheria. We don't see a whole lot of polio. We don't see a whole lot of you know. I think um, you know even a few generations ago, polio was pretty darn common. Um, other things we don't see a whole lot of anymore are, are, are measles. Though we're seeing you know little breakthroughs here and there. And I think that of all the interventions that you know public health has ever done, like in terms of a pure public health intervention, vaccinations probably have been the most effective um, thing when it comes to saving people's lives and you know reducing the burden of disease. This just actually emphasizes you know how much vaccinations have done even in the last ten years. And so this graph actually shows total deaths averted globally from 2011 to 2020 from immunizations um, just in low-income countries. And that figure is 23.3 million people. That's, I mean, like two-thirds the size of Canada. You know, if you look at sort of what vaccinations have led to the greatest, you know, um, number of lives saved, you know, like on the far left, you have measles vaccine, super, super important, actually, because it really can be quite a lethal disease if people are at all sort of medically compromised. But a lot of the other things there are things that we consider part of our routine program. So hepatitis B is on the list with, you know, 5 million deaths averted. Um, there's a <clears throat> pneumonia vaccine with, so you know, almost 2 million deaths averted. Um, human papillomavirus vaccine, which I'll talk about a bit later, but that's the thing that can prevent, you know, cervical, anal, or pharyngeal cancer. And I think that, yeah, they're, they're sort of like you know, these like unsung heroes of like, of, of a society in a way. Um, but I think what we're seeing now is a, a shift actually, not in the right direction when it comes to immunizations. So, I, I, you know, I think people obviously have now certainly heard of this notion of vaccine hesitancy, um, which, you know, I'll broadly define as, you know, people who are a little bit reluctant or, you know, outright don't want immunizations. And I think that in many ways has been driven by the success of immunizations, right? So, you know, with things like, you know, if we had a lot of people dying around us with polio, people in iron lungs, which are pretty common in the 50s and 60s, people would be a bit more concerned about these infectious diseases. We don't really see them anymore. And so this graph actually just shows um, just coverage of a vaccine called the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. It's a three-in-one in the United Kingdom. And basically, you know, their coverage rates were like pretty good, 90%, pretty similar to Canada's. And in the late 90s, <clears throat> there was a, a, a paper that was published um, by a fellow named Wakefield and his gang. And this paper completely debunked now, basically asserted that MMR was associated with this vaccine, was associated with autism and might even cause autism. Um, vaccines do not cause autism, just to be clear. Um, but what that led to was almost a 10 percentage point decline in coverage for that vaccine uh, in the United Kingdom, you know, and we didn't see a recovery in the UK for about, oh, 15 years. It wasn't until like the 2010s that, you know, like it, it came back. And, you know, what that led to was a whole series of measles outbreaks and mumps outbreaks and even rubella outbreaks in the United Kingdom. And I think that while 
you know, people have always sort of had concerns about vaccinations in a way, like ever since the first vaccine was given, it was a little vaccine against smallpox many, many centuries ago. You know, I, I think over the last few decades, it's really come a bit more to the fore. And I think that has been linked to notions of, you know, like maybe not trusting science as much, um, this idea that we shouldn't put chemicals into our body. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I think that that has driven um, a lot of vaccine has been seen, not as stark uh, prior to COVID as what we saw in the UK, but certainly there are a reasonable size contingent of anti-vaxxers um, in, in, in Canada. And now we are facing, you know, the greatest, certainly the greatest public health crisis of the last century, possibly, you know, one of the, the greatest societal crises maybe since the Second World War, and that's the COVID pandemic. And, you know, <laughs> this pandemic, has, you know, hundreds of millions of people have gotten COVID, like millions and millions of people have died um, around the world. And we're very lucky that, you know, in the late fall, late winter, we had, you know, news around these vaccines that were up to 95% effective. Um, you know, that news was really uplifting to me because it signified that we had the tools to effectively exit pandemic. But, What's basically happened is, you know, this vaccine hesitancy thing has been sort of like churning along and churning along. And now we have a vaccine hesitancy pandemic that's making it hard to actually deal with our actual COVID pandemic. And so this graph actually tracks sort of Canadians' willingness to take vaccine at different points in time as soon as it's available. Um, we work a lot with Angus Reid to do some of this polling. But, you know, in January, and numbers are similar now, only about 60 to 70% of Canadians would get a vaccine for COVID as soon as it was available to them. And that might sound pretty high, or I don't know if it does or not, but, you know, realistically, with what we know now about COVID, I think that people like Dr. Fauci are saying we need vaccine uptake of probably at least 85%, maybe even higher if we are to achieve herd immunity. And that 67% mark actually is a high water mark. If you look earlier in the, if you go to the fall, September, about, you know, 39% of Canadians would take the vaccine as soon as available. You know, anytime there's news around um, you know, a, a vaccine and a possible safety effect like AstraZeneca and blood clots, I think people get a bit more concerned. And, you know, people should have questions. They should be concerned. But vaccines are so, so incredibly safe. The one thing that'll get us back to normal, and we have about a third of Canadians who still won't get it when it's available to them. And, you know, that will cause quite a lot of harm if we can't change that. So that sort of sets the stage for, I guess, <clears throat> vaccination writ large, one, they're really effective, save millions of lives, and two, a lot of people do have questions, concerns, even in the midst of the, you know, the greatest societal crisis in decades. The, the focus of, you know, the talk ultimately today, though, is around <laughs> vaccines that aren't COVID-related or non-COVID stuff. You know, I think you probably get a lot of COVID news in the news. It's all over the news. And so I think when it comes to vaccination, it's important to realize that they are given throughout a person's life. And I think we often think of vaccines as things that kids get, and kids do get a lot of vaccines, um, childhood vaccines, we call them. Um, and, you know, they prevent those like crazy diseases we don't see anymore, like polio and diphtheria. Um, uh, but we also give vaccines after, you know, kids are, you know, five or whatever, right? So we give vaccines in adolescence. Uh, these are often school-based programs. Uh, so, you know, the HPV or Gardasil program is one of the big ones there. A lot of jurisdictions give hepatitis B vaccine, which is a vaccine that, you know, can sort of prevent against the hepatitis B virus, which causes essentially liver damage, possibly even liver cancer. And then there's a, a meningitis vaccine that we also give in adolescents. And, you know, meningitis, while not being particularly common, is extremely lethal. Um, I think that as we move further from childhood, now, beyond adolescence into adulthood, um, there are more and more vaccines that we recommend that adults get. And the coverage rates, as I'll show you in a bit, for adult vaccines are quite, quite low. Uh, you know, I think one of the really important ones is that the, the shingles vaccine. It's super, super, super effective. Um, it, it's been out for a, like a, a while now. I mean, it's not like, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think coverage remains really low. And then for a lot of adults, uh, we also, for most, for every adult, actually, we recommend a certain booster of a, of a vaccine for um, uh, a, a bacteria called strep pneumo that actually, well, causes pneumonia, but can also cause bloodstream infection as well as 
uh, as well as meningitis. So there's a lot of important adult vaccines that people should get, but like coverage rates are, are lower because I think we often do think of vaccines as childhood vaccines, and I think that's not true. And then, you know, lastly, I think that there are vaccines that we give to everybody every year. Um, you know, the best example of that is the influenza vaccine. And, you know, as I'll show later, co coverage rates for influenza vaccine are pretty dismal. Um, and, you know, I think the other piece to note is that if you don't have some of these vaccines, like you didn't get it in junior high or middle school, um, you know, a lot of these vaccines can be still taken later in life. Um, you know, especially like the HPV or the hepatitis B one. And, and then there's the ones that are actually given to older adults, like the, the shingles vaccine and the normal vaccine. And then the flu vaccine was given to everybody. And we'll talk a bit more about that. And, you know, I, I think if on the last slide, I you know, want to correct the maybe misconception that vaccines are primarily for kids, a lot of them for adults. The other is that vaccines don't necessarily just prevent against infectious diseases. Um, I mean, a lot of them do prevent against infectious diseases, but these infectious diseases don't, you know, they don't necessarily cause a fever and a cold or the, the way you might see COVID affecting people, they cause a lot of other like, you know, serious illnesses, right? So, you know, the, the human papillomavirus vaccine, I should say 1,200, not 2,000, but, you know, it prevents, its primary <clears throat> aim is to prevent the like, cancer, really. Uh, and so vaccines basically protect against cancer. Um, same with the hepatitis B vaccine, right? So that virus, when it gets into your liver, can cause something called liver cirrhosis, which is basically a hardening of the liver that makes things like your liver not really work, and then can lead to liver cancer. And then, you know, lastly, the, the shingles vaccine, which prevents, well, shingles, <laughs> say that, um, but that really is like a, a very painful complication to people who previously had chicken pox, and most people have had chicken pox. So <clears throat> I did want to focus in on a few vaccines that I think are particularly, you know, maybe off miss, particularly important. Focusing in at about human papillomavirus, HPV, I think that, <clears throat> again, we often think of vaccines as linked to, you know, infectious diseases, you know, like a pneumonia or fever, whatnot, but HPV-related cancers actually kill 1,200 Canadians a year, um, and this is one of the, the highest sort of preventable cancer burdens that we have. Um, I mean, the other thing it does prevent against is like general pull warts, but I, I think that, you know, these... 1,200 Canadians do not have to die every year, right? And I think, you know, vaccination can, like, if everybody is vaccinated, we could, you know, reduce this by 90 to 95%. And, you know, combined with some of the screening programs and treatment programs we have, we could virtually eliminate HPV-related deaths. And I think that that isn't something that maybe people are aware of in terms of the burden of the disease that it causes. Even though the vaccine is very, 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 very effective, you know, if we look at the uptake across the country, and this is a little map of Canada province, that depending on the province you're at, um, you know, only about 60, 70, at a very high mark, 80% of people have this vaccine. And, you know, actually throughout the COVID pandemic, what sort of happened is that a, a lot of the vaccines that we normally get through public health or through the schools, those programs have been stopped because, well, one, like, like you know, a lot of schools have been closed, uh, you know, a lot of family doctor's offices have been closed. And so we've seen drops in coverage by as much as 30 or even 40% from that 67% mark. And, and that's really, really, really bad. You're creating this, you know, like this huge potential burden of disease. Um, the, the good news is, I think, when it comes to this vaccine, if, you know, if people haven't gotten it or they're sort of missed their sort of their, their when they're supposed to get it in, in, in middle school or high school, um, you know, it is recommended to sort of all Canadians. NASI says you can use it uh, no matter sort of what age you are. And so you can catch up. And I think that's really, really important. Um, so I did want to talk about HPV just because, you know, I, again, I, I think we think of a lot of these vaccine preventable diseases as like things of the past, but we have one where a vaccine really works that kills 1200 Canadians every year. And we can, you know, take some pretty direct action to, to deal with that. Um, next up is, is shingles. And, you know, I, think that shingles is a disease that is, well, I've never had it, but like, it's like exquisitely painful. So as I said before, it's, you know, it's, you basically get shingles if you had chicken pox earlier, and then you get a sort of a reactivation of that chicken pox later in life. Uh, it, it does sort of go up. You're likely to getting shingles the older you are. Um, but regardless, about one in three Canadians like will get shingles once in their lifetimes. And, you know, if you just get regular shingles that uh, you get this sort of like 
band like rash that's like quite, quite painful. Um, but in a large proportion of people who have regular shingles, they may develop complicated, like sort of like more some complications of shingles, right? So one of the most common syndromes is this thing called postherpetic neuralgia. And postherpetic neuralgia is very painful, very difficult to treat, and it can be extremely debilitating. Um, you know, uh, an even sort of worse complication of shingles is this herpes zoster ophthalmicus, which sort of gets in your eye. And then, you know, that, that actually is like a bit of an emergency there. And so it's not a benign disease um, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, over the past sort of few decades, you know, different companies have been working on creating vaccines that work well against shingles. Um, and sort of the main product that we have on the market now is this thing called Shingrix, which is extremely effective, you know, 90, 95% plus effective in preventing shingles, preventing the complications. Um, and, you know, it, it, one of the good things about this vaccine is that no matter how old you are, it still seems to work quite well. So we know with a lot of other vaccines, the older you get, the, you know, sometimes the vaccines don't work as well because your immune system is a bit weaker. Uh, but for this one, it works well, whether you're 50, 60, 70, or even 80. Uh, and I think that, you know, the uptake of shingles, because it's not it's publicly funded in most provinces, is, is low. But, you know, I think it's certainly something that, you know, everybody over should get, I told my parents to get it, uh, because having shingles or post herpetic neuralgia is, is really, really, really quite bad. Um, so the last thing I'll talk about after, you know, the HPV, which causes cancer, shingles, great vaccine, <laughs> prevent something very, very painful, is influenza. So <clears throat> I think that, you know, in, in the pre-COVID world, of all the vaccine-preventable diseases, influenza killed the most Canadians um, out of any of these, these illnesses, right? So we estimate that in any given year, flu will you know, kill 3,500 Canadians, um, you know, four times that will be admitted to hospital when nobody wants to be admitted to hospital. And, you know, more than 10 times that will have to go to the emergency room. And, and flu is interesting. Um, in a way, it's like COVID sort of like, we think of it as something that, you know, makes your, you know, like gives you breathing problems, give you fever, but we know that COVID can sort of affect all systems of your body um, in all sorts of strange ways. And, and flu is also like that, actually. I mean, yes, it has a primary effect on, on your lungs, but it can trigger heart attacks, can trigger, you know, like cerebrovascular, it's like basically strokes, and it can make your diabetes worse, it can make your kidney disease worse. And so it too does affect multiple organ systems. And so it's not just a, you know, a, like a, a virus that infects your lungs and, and that's over and done with. It can, you know, really anybody with any of these chronic conditions, um, those chronic conditions can be exacerbated by, by flu. And, you know, I, I think I, of all these vaccines that we have, you know, this one has the lowest coverage for like a publicly funded vaccine as in it's free basically for everybody. Uh, so this sort of graph shows how many people have flu vaccine or get flu vaccine in Canada over time. Uh, and the dark blue bars are you know, people who are 65 plus the light blue bars are people who are 18 to um, 65, essentially, with a high-risk condition, which is basically any chronic disease. Um, and it doesn't show the total adult coverage. But realistically, uh, in any given year, we never get more than 30 to 40 percent of Canadians immunized with this vaccine. And I think that people don't realize, I mean, it's, it's, it's tricky because I think people like often say, I had the flu. Uh, and, you know, what they really had was like a rhinovirus or a little cold. I mean, the flu, even if you know, you don't end up in the emerge department or you don't end up hospitalized is a very debilitating illness that causes pretty bad fevers, pretty terrible muscle aches. And we seem to struggle to get more than a third of Canadians taking it. Um, because of COVID, you know, I think that people were a little bit more attuned to how respiratory viruses can really muck people up. And, and so last year, the government ordered a bit more vaccine and we maybe got a 5% lift in coverage, right? Still far from even 50% coverage. And this is one of the few places where the US does better than us. They have a higher flu coverage rate than we do. And so I think that it's, 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 we didn't see a lot of flu last year. You know, I don't know how much flu we'll see this coming year. Um, but as soon as we relax our physical distancing and social distancing, which we need to do, we will see a resurgence of flu just like we did before. And whether that shingles, Gardasil, anything, it is really, really important that people not forget about the regular vaccinations that keep them safe and healthy. Yes, everybody should get the COVID vaccine. 
Um, but there's a whole lot of other vaccines people should get to prevent against these infectious diseases and even these cancers. So I think my time is up, so I will stop talking, but uh, thanks for having me. Dr. Hu, you know, before I let you go, I do have a question I do want to ask specifically about the COVID vaccine, but I just want to remark on one thing you mentioned, which was, you know, as we age, the importance of staying on top of our vaccines. And I know I have two little young ones and I still carry around their yellow vaccine cards, which as we age, you know, those, we either lose track of those and a lot of people just don't know what vaccines they've had. So I think that maybe as a society, governments can do a better job of informing people of what vaccines they need. Would you agree? Uh, yeah, and um, absolutely. And I think you, you know, it's funny, like I, I, I did my medical training in, in Toronto and those little yellow cards are pretty like easy to lose. The one good yeah. thing out of the COVID thing with respect to that is basically every single province building an electronic registry of the vaccines. And so in the future, hopefully little yellow cards will be a thing of the past and we will have a better sense of what you've had, um, you know, now and 20 years ago. So let me just ask you about the COVID vaccine, because we have a lot of questions from people with whether it's a different, maybe they have a condition or otherwise call it an autoimmune disorder, or maybe a woman is pregnant or breastfeeding. Are there any reasons why someone should think twice about getting the COVID vaccine? No, the, the only reason somebody shouldn't get a COVID vaccine is if they've had an anaphylactic reaction to like a part of the vaccine before. Anaphylaxis being like not regular allergies, but this is like the part where you need epi, you have trouble breathing, you need to go to the eMERGE. And, you know, fundamentally, the vaccine is, it's like a dead vaccine as opposed to a live vaccine. You know, it can't give you COVID. And so it should be safe, really, in all these populations um, by and by. Uh, it might not work as well in people who have a weakened immune system. And that's something we're learning about actually day by day right now. But it is extremely, extremely, extremely safe. Thank you. And Dr. Hu, I had a question for you as well. You spoke to the 5% lift with the flu vaccine, and even through some of my own work, I've seen the numbers increase this year with flu vaccinations. But there's been a little bit of misinformation around the fact that now that we have COVID, it seems like the flu has disappeared, and is there some sort of a conspiracy? Could you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, 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 no, it's a really good question. I mean, the reason why we don't see as much flu is because, you know, fundamentally, COVID is more infectious than flu, right? And we've done these lockdowns that basically, well, they can't necessarily, they, they can drop our COVID numbers, but they're good enough at really stopping flu. And, and most other, like I, I suspect people have had fewer colds this year than in prior years. But as soon as we open up again, these things will come back. And, you know, I, I, I certainly do not want to ever live through another lockdown year. I don't think anybody else does. And it'll come back just the same as before. You know, it's, just, it's all a function of how much human beings interact with one another. And I do want us interacting with one another more and more as soon as we can do so safely. So it's not a conspiracy. <laughs> Those are great points. Thank you again, Dr. Who.